Thank you once again for tuning in to the Dancing Sober podcast. I really appreciate you guys following me here. I want to give a big shout out again to our sponsor, Movita Juice Bar. Only good stuff. That's what they say that they use in all of their products. And they really are good. Check them out at movitajuicebar.com or you can use your food app to order something delivered to your house. If you are thinking or have been thinking of doing a podcast and you wanted to use this studio, you could reach out to Outer Circle Media through Instagram or through outercirclemedia.com. Hit them up. Um, please uh, subscribe, hit the like button. If you subscribe, you're an artist, your muse will be woken. Today's guest started selling smoothies at a local farmer's market and is now running a mini empire of plant-based foods. Give it up for Jocelyn Ramirez. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dancing Sober Podcast. I'm really happy that you guys follow us here. And today's guest is La Chef Extraordinaire. I keep using that word extraordinaire yeah. with everybody. I need a new word. <laughs> <laughs> the magical chef, the yeah. plant-based chef, <laughs> the Jocelyn magical. Ramirez. Yay. Thanks Welcome. so much. Thanks so much for having me, Rafa. It's good to I'm catch up with you again. Happy to have you here. And also, you're our first entrepreneur. So I've had artists. Mm -hmm. I've had people that are administrators in the art world, had musicians. And um, yeah, you're our first entrepreneur, which is also like what I want to get into, too. And so I'm excited. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. And before we get into like your crazy life that you have right now. <laughs> And I like, have Valida well, Loca, like, <laughs> tatted on my... Yeah. And we have such a limited time today, so let's uh, let's get into it. And um, I, I like to start with, like, where were you born? Where'd mm -hmm. you grow up? Yeah, I grew up in Southeast LA and Southgate mm -hmm. specifically. Um, born and raised. My parents still live in the same house that I grew up in. Wow. Um, so, you know, it's a Southeast LA suburb of the city, mm -hmm. uh, not too far from downtown. And... Um, you know, grew up in a neighborhood on the same block as a school. So it's like mostly mm. school and like a few houses on the block. Um, and just, you know, spent my time there going around like with the neighborhood kids to like the liquor store and then going, jumping over the fence to play basketball and like doing all the things. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's what some people would consider a food desert. Um, and there is still, you know, quite a bit of like a, food options available however it's like pretty limited to you know yeah. fast food chains stuff like that now you say you were young and you used to go to the liquor store a lot but just to make it clear, oh like, yeah and candy everyone <laughs> just to make it clear like candy. the neighborhoods that we grew up in have liquor stores that have yeah. candy and yeah. soda <laughs> that's what we yeah, go for yeah i used to like those um i don't even know what they're Abs called Abbas. no like they're the strings they you would get them with the pinzas You'd be like, oh, I have 20 cents. And each one was like 10 cents. And you would get them with the pizza. Yeah, it's like a in, a... in a paper bag. It's like a... Like a, a thin... Sugar-covered, like, fruit roll-up. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind yeah. of sour. Yeah, sour yeah. sour things, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they still have those. They do? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I still go to the liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> in my neighborhood. You're yeah. like, uh, where are the pizzas? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you grew up down there. You went to school in in that area you went to southeast yeah i or so i did was that school existing yet uh or? it well southgate high school was like the mm. high school there however i ended up going to private school all the way from mm. kindergarten through uh high school because i have a brother who's closest in age to me he's seven years older mm. and um my dad has six kids total my brother and i are the youngest and so my dad's older four kids all went to private school um you know, he was like very adamant about that. And with my brother, he was OK with going through the public school system. And my brother struggled mm. a lot. He um, he ended up, you know, dropping out of high school and like Damn. just going through a lot. And so my dad was like, no, she's going all the way through yeah. um, from kindergarten through. So I went to Lutheran, Catholic, um, Christian schools. It was pretty wild. Uh, the my high school that I went to was all all women or all all girl mm. high school. Um, the first year was co-ed, and then it transitioned to all girls. What school so, was it? St. Matthias. St. Matthias. So there's a St. Matthias in HP, which mm. is a junior high, and I think it might even be an elementary school, but then the one that I went to was in Downey. For, it was specifically a high school, mm. um, and it was all girls. Mm. So mm. you learned most of your, I don't know what you would call it, 
behavioral behavioral <laughs> <laughs> we're making up new words <laughs> your behavior uh from like catholics i mean yeah i don't know what i was gonna say there um i uh i kind of see where you're kind of going with it though like yeah, yeah I, I guess there is a certain kind of like ethical framework that mm -hmm. comes from you, you know like being at that's a what religious i was gonna say ethical school. framework yeah. that's exactly what <laughs> yeah. i was gonna say i read your mind yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that i learned right here con las moncas you know um However, I mean, I, I feel like it's it's kind of a little bit of a, a myth, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like, I actually ended up, as an adult, not believing in religion, even yeah. though I went through... But even, even that, I mean, even if you don't, of course, you grow up and you learn that, you know, religion is something different than you were taught. Mm -hmm. But the whole ethical framework <clears throat> that I was thinking about, <laughs> yeah. you still get taught that. Yeah. And you still grow up with a specific way of mannerisms, behaviors, and, yeah. and respect for elders etc like little things yeah. like that that i mean also our culture teaches yeah absolutely. but um it's definitely reinforced by a school like that yeah I, I i think the only contradiction that i find you know just thinking back on that whole like growth process of going through mm. religious schools is like it's very fear-based mm. so yeah. you know it's, it's like, yeah it's like <laughs> yeah. it's like this is gonna happen to you or like they yeah. this person you know it's just like so fear yeah. Um, it's like co very conflicting instead mm. of being like, let's step into the power of like what it's like to mm. just feel joy and mm. happiness and like, you know, care for uh, other people from that perspective versus like being afraid that something's going to happen to you if yeah. you don't do the right thing. Um, so it was, you know, interesting way to kind of yeah. think about religion as an adult. Um, cause obviously I was scared. Yeah. <laughs> I was scared during uh, all my years until I got to like, I think I might've been in, uh, junior year or senior year of high school where, you know, I was, I would say that I was like kind of cool with like, the, you know, there's always cliques in all high schools. Right. And so I felt like I was kind of cool with most of the people in the different cliques. And so like any class that I was in, like I always had like a few people that I had like chit chat with or whatever. Mm. And of course, like you get in trouble. Right. Um, and so I can't remember exactly what happened, but like a few of us laughed and we had this teacher who f got really upset and pulled us out and she took us into the hallway and she's like, you're all just going to get pregnant. What? You're not going to graduate from high school. You're just going to, you're, you're not wow. even going to get to go to college. Like I'm, we're all wasting our time here with you, wow. you know, like scared the shit out of you. Pretty yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like, wow, <laughs> like that's, what you're instilling in these young women yeah. instead of kind of empowering them to, you know, like be more proactive in class or be more involved or create an engaging environment. Yeah. In fact, it was like the opposite. Yeah. So yeah, that's Well, you kind of grew <laughs> up like at the transition of when things were a lot more that way and, oh, yeah. and the transition of people being a lot more open to um, being supportive, I yeah. guess, you know, even parents and mm -hmm. teachers. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. So where were you born? I was born in East L.A. In East L.A. Yeah. At the, I'm going to guess, it's like Santa a, Marta. No, is it Santa Marta? I can't remember. On Cesar Chavez in it, Humphreys? <coughs> it's not there no more. It's, it's a not school there now. no more. Yeah, Santa Marta. Really? Yeah, yeah. You know my life, <laughs> Rafa. Well, I know East L.A. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Santa Marta. Um, all I know is that, yeah, it's, it was on Cesar Chavez, like Hilda East Solis L.A. High school now. Yeah, it's yeah. No, no longer a hospital. And um, and I don't know why uh, a couple years back I was like, mom, like, I don't know why I get super called to yellow, like the color yellow huh. all the time. And I'm a Leo. So like I think about like sunshine and all this stuff. And I like, I don't know, we just started talking about me growing up. And then we got to the point where like she was talking about my birth story. Mm. I was born on like a Monday at 8 a.m. And she was like, and the place was painted yellow. Mm. And I don't know. And just mm -hmm. all these things like um. She was like, your legs came out and your legs were like crossed. And she's like, tú sabes como la foto que tienes ahí con el señor de la yoga? Así tenías las piernas cruzadas when you came out. Like your legs wow. were just like kind That's of bold legged like that. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, whoa. So I don't know. It just it just created all these like ideas of like, you know, my journey yeah. in utero, <clears throat> like in my past life and what I, I don't know. It was just kind of interesting. Now, I started seeing you like around like, different art events back mm -hmm. in the days, you know, around 2010, 2012-ish. Yeah. And then I think, did I photograph you with people's yoga? Because I did a photo shoot oh, with everybody. Oh, yeah. I, I think you were in that. 
probably in sure. the very early stages, like before yeah. I was kind of like officially. Yeah, before you started doing like uh, teaching your, your classes. own stuff. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, but anyways, I did a photo shoot back then. So you were first involved like heavily in the whole yoga like mm-hmm. community, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, that really started because like I I grew up going, you know, in high school, like being a part of a lot of different sports programs. Mm. So I was always kind of like competitive by nature, but like just kind of a little bit athletic. I, I'm not going to say I, I'm not going to say I was good. <laughs> you know, I just like <laughs> I was there and I played sports. Um, and then uh, I started getting into like other things as an adult. And I really gravitated towards yoga and the first yoga classes that I would take were because I got Groupons and coupons Mm. to go to places, but not because I really aligned to the people there or the instructors. Mm. It was just like, this is a really different approach to working out Mm -hmm. uh, where you don't need anything. You don't need like, you know, a baseball or a glove or like a, you know, a piece of equipment. Yeah. Yeah, You can, you can like learn or you can practice just with your own body and that's Mm. it. And, uh, and then it was, I can't remember how I found out about people's yoga space, but it's back when they used to practice there at the, um, at the Boyle Hotel. Mm, and okay. I walked in one day and it was like all these people of color, all from mm. the area. Mm. Uh, I think Leah was teaching the class and just in the ways that she like guided us and the way the class ended, like I just felt like I had finally found something that resonated with me on yeah. a much deeper level than just a workout. Yeah. And so I, from there, I was like, whatever you need, like I, you know, I want to yeah, help yeah. out. So was there to kind of help even when they opened their, their studio, like to help yeah. knock down walls and do whatever. Yeah. Interesting. <clears throat> so I want to also get into, um, I didn't know that you also have a degree in art and yeah. design. Yeah. Where did that happen <laughs> and how did that happen? Yeah. So that's my past life. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, no. it's still you. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's very much you, yeah. I think, because, um. One of the things that I've noticed ever since you first started with Todo Verde is like you always have great design. Oh, all of thanks. your logos, all of your products, all of your, um, you know, flyers or whatever. It was mm. always like beautiful design. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's partly because of that. Yeah. So where'd you go to art school or, or was it? Yeah, I went to Woodbury University okay. in Burbank, uh, mostly known as like a liberal arts architecture school. They also oh, have a school yeah. of business. And so I went there. I have a degree in fine art um, where I really uh, had an emphasis in like graphic design. I did some fashion design. I did like marketing and stuff like that, but really focus on the arts yeah. generally. So did that for undergrad, started my first business with a couple friends right after undergrad that doing what um we did event design so uh, if you were you know you had your new business that you were wanting to start and you're like i need a logo i need you know i need business cards i need a website i need i want to do a launch event we were there to kind of plug in and see how we can help support that and and we were having a lot of fun and we had this like cool office space in silver lake and and I was like, I don't know if we're like actually doing well financially. Like I hadn't, I didn't have that business mindset. Yeah. It was just like fun. Yeah. We're getting paid to have fun. But then, you know, wondering like. And it like, feels good to help these clients. And Yeah, it's it's like, yeah, it's definitely like a really inspiring approach to like see their startup grow. Hmm. Uh, and and I decided to go back to business school. So then I have a degree in, in business as well. Um, from the same school? Yeah, from okay. the same school. Yeah. So it's like when I was, uh, so I actually went to school there. I went to Woodbury, graduated. Um, I was a student leader throughout my time there in undergrad. In undergrad, and, uh, and then when I decided to go back to school, I was still in touch with some of the administrative folks that I had worked with as mm. a student. Um, and so they were hiring for a position. And essentially I was like, okay, well, if I, if I work here, I could get my master's for half the price. Mm. So, <laughs> so that's you became a teacher. That yeah, was another question yeah. that I had because I, I know that you were teaching something, but I was like, when were you a teacher? Like, when did yeah. you do this? That's crazy. Yeah. So after I finished my master's, I was able to teach on the undergraduate level. Wow. So I was teaching uh, classes like social justice and civic engagement, wow. leadership for community building, uh, courses that were like entry level for transfer students entering like architecture programs or art programs and wow. stuff like that. So like kind of getting them accl- acclimated into like a university life and like what to expect. 
Stuff like that. Your first surprises. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't know these things about you. I just thought you started like this, you know, food company, which we'll get to in a yeah. second. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm really impressed by all that. That's awesome. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, your um, Mexican Ecuadorian mm. um, mm -hmm. family. Yeah, my um, I will say I mostly resonate with my mom's side of the family, which mm. they're they're from Mexico. My family's from Zacatecas. Mm. My dad's side of the family is from Quito, mm. and I've visited my dad's uh, family in Quito as an adult, maybe about. I don't know, maybe like eight, nine years ago now um, and got to see like where he grew up. And it, it was really wild to see like how distinctly different their lives wow. were in those areas because like they both grew up in, in poverty. My mom was living more of like a rancho life, hmm. um, you know, growing a lot of their food and trading with other folks. And my dad grew up in a city and their poverty was just like different. You hmm. know, um, they didn't have access to the same types of things that my mom had. Um, and then they migrated here and they met here in Los Angeles and um, and, you know, just kind of growing up with those like very, you know, they're both kind of like, you know, Latinx or, mm. you know, like Spanish speaking communities, but very different. Mm. The food is different. My dad doesn't like spicy food, you know, <laughs> like they have different words for everything. Like elote is elote in Mexico and in Ecuador it's choclo. Like mm. there's all these different like language. What's the South American word for salsa? Ahi. Ahi. Yeah. Yeah, I love that word. That's yeah. Word. So, so I mean, I, I feel like I mostly resonate with my mom's side, though, because I, I grew up with my abuelita who, you know, migrated here and they, like, they lived in Canoga mm -hmm. Park and we would see them often with the rest of our family and ate a lot of that, like, Mexican style, like, mm -hmm. guisado, rancho style food. For my dad's side, however, like there's all this drama that we won't get all deep into here, but like there was all this family. But we can. No. I know, right? <laughs> abuelita. ¿Por qué me hiciste? No, you know, I'm all crying. ¿Por qué me hiciste esto? It's, we're totally open to anything. Yeah, I know, right? Just so you know. Um, no, it was, just, it was just all this family drama where, like, uh, uh, my dad migrated here with, you know, his, his, he had four kids and a wife, and mm -hmm. that didn't work out. And then, you know, he, he met my mom here and had two kids with my mom. And so my grandmother on my dad's side was just like, what are you doing with this Mexican mm. woman? Like you had this Ecuadorian family you migrated here with and it just created all this friction. And um, my grandmother on my dad's side didn't want anything to do with us. Mm. So even as much as my dad tried to to build a bridge, because mm. obviously I, I have nothing to do with that. Of course not. Yeah. Right. Um, but I just never was able to build a relationship with her. Oh. So it's sad. It's it's something I, I wished for, you know, yeah. especially like as I was older, I wished to have something have, with her yeah. or to like learn her food because my dad talks about her food all the time. But I didn't imagine. learn any of it. Yeah. So and and it's interesting because after she passed away, uh, I was like, well, there, th that's it. Like, there's no kind of that's the end of that relationship for what it mm. was. Right. Mm. Which was <laughs> minimal at that. And um, and I went to see a shaman and the shaman was like, your grandmother is here. And I was Wait, like, I want to go back. Where did you go see a shaman? I wanna, <laughs> I, I've never done these kind yeah. of things. I know that, that these things happen a lot in our community, but I've never been to a sweat. I've never seen oh, a shaman. Yeah. I've never like, you know, experienced this kind of thing. So where does one find a shaman? I mean, honestly, it was uh, like a friend of a friend. Mm. So it's just kind of like. I want to see some, you know, it's just kind of putting the information out there. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to see somebody to help me, who, help, to help guide me through X, mm -hmm. Y, Z. Mm -hmm. And then if you say that enough, somebody's going to be like, I know somebody mm -hmm. who can guide you through X, Y, Z. Okay. So it's just kind of like airing your dirty laundry. Like maybe no. somebody on watching is going to be like, hey, <laughs> you still need some therapy around okay. that. You know, let's talk or whatever, you know. <laughs> So, yeah, I went um, and saw this person. She was based in Silver Lake. Hmm. And, uh, and she was like very clear. Like that's you're, that's uh, like a sitcom if I've ever heard. I of know. <laughs> the Silver shaman Lake. of Silver Lake. Yeah, I know. We met there. <laughs> you know, she okay. didn't live there. But um, yeah, and, she, and I was like, no, my abuelita, at that point, my mom's mom was still alive. So I was like, oh, no, she's still alive. And hmm. she's like, no, like this is your grandmother. And I was like, uh, and I was like, well, actually, like my dad's mom passed away, but in life mm. she wanted nothing to do with me. And 
and yeah and it turns out like she was like it's it's her it's she was like um there's no doubt about it like she's right behind you and like my head kept tilting back and i felt like this this heaviness but also like somebody was holding me Hmm. um and so i you know i afterwards i like talked with my dad about it and he's like yeah i mean she probably like regrets Hmm. not wanting to have any sort of relationship with you like you know again it had nothing to do with that so now we're getting into my my family deep trauma right there but uh (laughs) thank you for sharing i mean that's a beautiful story too i mean it's it's definitely like something that um you know i i'm sure that people go through this all the time there's there's people that don't have relationships in their families and so it's sad like i have you know my other siblings i have a sister who wants nothing to do with me for the same reasons because on the same yeah yeah yeah, you know yeah yeah yeah, because she's she thinks you know um our family like broke their family which yes is is true like that happened but but like at the same time no like just go forward yeah Yeah, exactly and like build relationships and so it's just interesting to kind of like navigate those like family dynamics and so you know with that when i went to ecuador um you know my dad has like cousins and you know uncles and like different nephews and nieces and those folks were like so happy to meet us Mm -hmm. like so embracing like i can't wait to go back in fact i was going to go back in 2020 with my partner rudy Mm -hmm. but then the pandemic happened and we haven't been able to schedule that again but like i want to go and you know enjoy more of the food and learn more about the culture because i just felt like my dad wasn't like a the greatest vehicle for that my dad was an entrepreneur hard worker Mm -hmm. learned a lot from him but like as a machista man like he just didn't carry the like the culture and the food ways in Mm. the ways that maybe like a woman or my grandmother could have Mm -hmm. which is kind of you know not great to say out loud i guess (laughs) but it's it's sometimes very true it doesn't matter yeah (laughs) (laughs) i don't don't think he's hurt by that yeah um so speaking of then um your family and um your dad uh, i know that you started to be more concerned about food and things Mm -hmm. because of your dad's health at one point right yeah so how did that come to be? And then I guess let's get into like how you started to develop this company called mm-hmm. Todo Verde. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I have been, I, I still continue to deal with the thyroid issue that I learned about in my mid 20s or something. I just learned about that. Really? Because you have that? Yeah. Hypothyroidism. Yeah. 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 It's a thing. It's a real thing. Yeah. So fortunately, my thyroid functions well so like i don't have hyper or hypothyroidism Mm. but i have these nodules in my thyroid Mm. and uh and they were growing for a long time and then i decided what can i do like Mm. you know so i started getting into like um different like minerals you can look at or like seaweed and kelp and all this stuff and like eliminating sea salt and like i was trying to do iodized salt or like incorporate iodine more like i just got into this whole world Mm. that i didn't really know about and then i started integrating more plant-based into my personal diet and so as i was seeing a little bit of results from that in in a very positive way in fact like knock on wood but like now when i go in for ultrasounds Mm. because every doctor was like take it out it's not functioning or it's not gonna it's gonna maybe have cancer and like they didn't have clear um uh like uh, like they didn't know exactly how things would play out but they were just so clear on like just take it out and you can take these pills for hormones Mm -hmm. um and i was very adamant that i didn't want to do that so i started playing around with like diet and then when my my dad got cancer the first time uh you know we obviously like you know went the whole like western medicine route only and like did radiation therapy and like just did that didn't change anything else in terms of lifestyle Mm. but then when it came back again i was like okay like (laughs) we're gonna do all the things that we need to do with the doctors but we also have to change our diet and like exercise more and try to see if plant-based could work and in the two months lead up time that he uh, he had before a major surgery his doctors were like your diabetes is like super resolved and (laughs) you know like they were just noticing how much stronger he was getting and how how much healthier he was looking and feeling Mm. after just two months of a predominantly plant-based diet and so i started playing around more with recipes and my family was like like this is your thing if you could get like everybody to just try it for two months 
Yeah. It's crazy because I went, <clears throat> I was at a point in my life like around, well, when I stopped drinking really, uh, like the year before was like I was feeling like horrible. I was mm-hmm. feeling really bad and part of it was drinking, but I knew that it was more than just drinking. I knew it was the way that I was eating. So when I stopped drinking, I also went vegan. Oh, for, wow. I'd lasted two years and but you immediately feel the results like after a month you already yeah. start feeling like wow i don't have like i'm not carrying all this junk in my body anymore mm-hmm. you know like the fuel is burning better and yeah i mean it really depends on if you're eating whole foods because mm-hmm. i think you know when people say vegan or plant-based like yeah. you could eat a bunch of bread and pasta and like all this stuff you know or you could also eat more like plant forward and eating like whole grains and veggies and all this stuff mm. um and still make it taste really good and so yeah when i, think when I first did it i didn't know how to do it so i was like just beans and oh, veggies yeah <laughs> hey that works and it took me a while the first vegan restaurant i went to was gratitude and, oh yeah and so after being there i was like oh i could do that oh i can do yeah. that so that's how i like managed to like make it last for a while yeah and if you try good food then it's just a matter of you trying to replicate that good food at yeah. home and so like that's been a, a bunch of the work that I've done with Todo Verde and like, you know, when I first started, it was at farmer's markets. I knew I wanted to open a restaurant or like do something more with savory food. But at the time, because I was in higher education, mm. I was and, and doing more like design based work. I was like, I don't really know how to start a food business. So I'm going to start real <clears throat> simple. I'm going to be at the farmer's market. I'm going to sell agua fresca and smoothies. So I was I would, there. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah. And like we, you know, we had had our little blenders and like yeah. it was crazy trying to also follow the health department regulations because like we had to take a three compartment sink and then I had mm. to like pump hot water into it. So I had to get like a little portable water heater and a generator to like and it was just so much drama. Like y'all don't even know, like whoever's listening, if you want to like people have approached me afterwards and they're like, oh, can you tell me like how simple it was for you to start a smoothie business at the farmer's market. I'm like, it's such a headache because of the health department. <laughs> um, and so I had to get a big old van to fit everything in there because I thought I could just make do with my car. It didn't work out that way. Um, but knowing like, OK, I'm here to kind of learn the process, um, see if people gravitate towards this brand that I'm mm-hmm. creating that really centers like a Latinx experience around plant based food. Um, if people resonate with it, if they, if I can gain repeat customers, if we can, I was about to say like the first time I went was to support. Mm -hmm. And then after that is because it was good. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it really was good. So people always came out to see you and to get that and post you and, you know, yeah. And I remember when you first bought that van and started posting your van, you're like, (laughs) look at this girl. I was out quemando llanta right there. Yeah. Killing it. Showing up at the farmer's market. Yeah. But I mean, that, that, and you know, for the smoothies even, like, you know, because of my business training in school, um, when I was thinking about starting Todo Verde a year before I started a business plan and I was also doing focus groups Hmm. with friends and family and like asking, what do you think about this logo? What do you think about this? And Mm. I would like test some of the smoothie recipes with folks Mm. and be like, would you pay this much money for it? Would you come back again? Is it is it too much ice, too little ice, too many dates? Is it too sweet? Wow. Yeah. So see, like here I was thinking that you just said, oh, well, let's get the blender and let's let's set it up. But no, you did all this homework before. For a whole year before damn and like got permits and insurance and like toda la chingadera right there no know? i think i remember one time <laughs> that i saw you loading or unloading and i was like this is a lot of fucking work yeah like just it's a ton a of work and you were going from like spot to spot you mm-hmm. know trying to you know do events and mm-hmm. then go back to that and it was like yeah but you know you did it and you kicked ass doing it um, not just because you had the training, but also because you work extremely hard. And how did you then decide like, oh, well, now I want to cater. Yeah. And I want to make food. And yeah. Let's 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 turn it up a notch because yeah. I'm not doing enough. I know. Right. Because <laughs> I need more things to do. Yeah. You need more things. to yeah, do. Yeah. I mean, I that was always the goal. Like when I wrote the business plan, it was in three phases. Like mm. first phase, farmer's market, only smoothies, this and that second phase commercial kitchen with catering and uh, third phase is restaurant which i haven't completed yet Mm. uh but you know like and i had like timeline and years and the whole thing 
Um, and so I got access to this commercial kitchen space and also knew at that point, because we had started doing Smorgasburg, which is a big food event in mm. LA, like we had enough farmers markets and Smorgasburg to be like, all right, I can invest in like getting a commercial kitchen now and starting to integrate savory food out options. And that's a whole beast in itself. It's crazy because it's like so much preparation. Honestly, like sometimes I, I still wonder like why the hell did I choose food? It's such a crazy industry with such small margins that people just will never understand until yeah. they work in the food industry. Yeah. So like when people are like, oh, that that's expensive or, oh, you know, whenever they say stuff like that, I'm just like, oh, like just just go yeah. home and make your own food, yeah. you know? <laughs> It's hard make, in our community to not for, like yeah. to not be cheap. I mean, yeah. it's hard in our community because even like to get hired for certain things, you know, as a photographer, it's like sometimes you set your price and you just have to stick to it. You really do. And it sucks sometimes to have to say no, but yeah, it's it's really tough because. You know, when I first started, my my main mission was also like accessibility. Mm. And over the years, just really because I, I didn't have a clue about what the food industry was like before that. But then I come mm. in and I'm like, everything needs to be affordable and accessible and la la la, which is like great, I think, in, in theory. Um, but now, like being so deep into it and, and it's funny because I, I went to a panel when I first started and there was a couple folks from the food industry speaking on the panel and somebody was like, oh, you use all farmers markets ingredients for your restaurant. And, you know, what about accessibility? And everybody's saying, like, you know, you have to we have to have more equity, which I agree. Like, I agree. Um, and she was just like, that just can't exist. It mm. just doesn't exist. Like, if you want to pay living wages, mm. pay for good quality ingredients and all the overhead that it costs to have a restaurant, which mm. is like rent, utilities, insurance, all permits, permits <sighs> like everybody comes out of the woodwork you owe them money for something mm. the city and the state and the you know all these things um she's like if if you want to have a business that like centers all these other mm -hmm. things that hold value like paying somebody well and giving them good hours and getting good quality ingredients like you i would have to do this as a volunteer <laughs> and and honestly i see that now yeah. and it's 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 hard and so like what i've been navigating through for the last few years is like I want to just give recipes and like try to empower people mm. to try to make this more at home, not to take away the fact that like I don't want people to eat our food like I mm. do. And, you know, when I have my but restaurant, I want to have like a pay what you can bowl and like yeah. different things that create more accessibility. But at the same time, it's like, how could I empower you to like yeah. do this as your lifestyle versus just depending on my business to feed you yeah. when, like, you know, like kind of yeah. like when you went to Cafe Gratitude and you're like, oh, yeah. I can make this. Yeah. And they also have a community bowl. Yeah. They call it a community bowl where it's like you pay what you can. Yeah. And you won't get turned away. Yeah. yeah. So that's so. a great idea. Yeah. But also by offering, um, you know, your recipes in the New York Times and your recipes and um, different YouTube videos and things, you're, that's your way of being accessible. I mean, of course, people have to go out and buy the stuff, which can also be expensive. Yeah. But... um. <clears throat> Can you explain what a jackfruit is? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, that. you know, yes, some of the ingredients can be expensive because you're buying them, but you're not going to typically use all of that ingredient all in one yeah. shot. So it'll last you a little bit of time. So it may look more expensive, you know, ticket price. Yeah. But then as you're using it, it's not that bad. Yeah. Um, so like a gar gar is like kind of more expensive, but it's like you use a little bit of it. Gar -gar you know it's, it's it's like a vegan gelatin that you use to like make cheeses and stuff oh okay okay you know um but um Oops, sorry about that Híjole, ¿qué comiste? I no. <laughs> okay Passing vehicle. i know right uh so a jackfruit a jackfruit is a fruit that you uh typically grows in like mexico asia looks like a big old watermelon spike spiky green uh on the outside and then when you cut into it, it, it when it's young green jackfruit, you cut into it, it like has this very like shreddable meat like texture that looks like shredded chicken or yeah. shredded pork. But when it's ripe, it's actually like a really sweet, delicious, very unique fruit. Like it's mm. almost a cross between like a pineapple, papaya and a mango. Mm. Um, and so like a lot of people use it for meat 
an, a meat alternative like we do, but it has to be young green. Mm. Um, and then I don't recommend folks buying a whole jackfruit at their local grocery store. Mm. Like it's better to buy a can or a pouch. Ones. No, not even like oh, no. get get a <clears throat> pouch, get a can because because they're grown elsewhere and they're imported mm. when they arrive they're already, already a little getting, bit sweet mm. so they're past the point of like using them for what you intend to yeah use and it's also like really hard to break them down like if i told people you had to break that down fresh mm. like you have to cover your knife in coconut oil because they have like a latex in, like a natural latex in the jackfruit wow. um so it's just like a, a more dramatic than it needs to be like yeah. most food businesses use a pouched or canned young green jackfruit. That's good so. to know because it makes it just easier to work with. Yeah, yeah, and I have videos on our YouTube that folks can check out to see how I break it down. So let's um, try to move along and get into like La Vida Verde. Mm -hmm. Like how did, well, I mean, it's obvious how all this all got to you, but um, when did you start putting that together? Because it's a beautiful book. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I... Oops, <laughs> that was You're... supposed to be on silent. Oh, Go yeah. On. So I, um, I had just written down on like one of my New Year's, um, what do you call it? Like a vision board, you mm -hmm. know, of like, I want to write a cookbook. I journaled it. I want to write a cookbook. I had no clue how to do that. Uh, and then a few months later, a publishing house reached out to me and they're like, we see what you're doing and your social media. And like, we want to work with you to That's... write a cookbook that's the way to do it yeah i'm telling you just like put it out there into the universe do the work that's what i always say yeah do the work, i mean you have work, to do, do the work, work but yeah. then also like things will come say like out uh, loud into the universe like i'm looking for this yeah i'm looking for a million dollars okay me too million <laughs> two million <laughs> um and uh and so you know i talked to a bunch of other author friends who had written books to just see what they thought mm -hmm. and you know i remember one of my friends walter who wrote compton cowboys he was like fuck it you know mm. like let's do it like because we were going to publish cookbooks that came out around the same time and he was like yeah like That's let's badass. get that book going we were talking about audiobooks and he, he was like how do you do an audiobook of a cookbook it's you can't do it it's not done i don't think <laughs> uh because it's like no lo estás quemando la tortilla se está yeah. quemando <laughs> It'd be too hard you know? to follow it if <laughs> yeah. you're like talking yeah. imagine uh. um and so I, it took me about a little over a year to write the yeah. book, which is honestly like pretty difficult. It's a really fast timeline. Usually you get at least two years, if not more, yeah. to write a book. I had a lot of the recipes already because I had been making them with Todo Verde. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it made it a little bit faster to kind of get that going and like get them tested and everything. But like friends came through, they, they like, tested a bunch with me like you know i had a friend who photographed the book mm. um and you know i was really excited about like a book tour and all this stuff and had been like preparing and then the pandemic happened my book was gonna launch april 14th 2020 Damn. and then the pandemic happened and i was like chica su madre Damn. ya se acabó todo you know like yeah, but it still like sold like wildfire, I'm sure, it right? It still yeah. did really well. So <clears throat> surprisingly enough, because a month had gone by since the shutdown or the lockdown, mm. I think people were really excited or um, looking forward to like getting excited about something and <laughs> cooking more at home. And so it actually came out in a, in a really great time, which is weird to say. I didn't do the whole book it's, tour, but like I did a bunch of virtual stuff. Somehow during the pandemic, like people were spending money because it's also like as soon as the pandemic started, like I sold so many prints during the oh, pandemic. Oh, yeah. Like that's what literally paid my rent. Yeah. Because I used to do event photography, but then when the pandemic hit, no events, yeah. I started selling prints and people were buying a ton of prints. So, yeah. I mean, I'm thankful for the people that supported like during that time because the people that had money mm -hmm. were like there to to be there for you <clears throat> absolutely now i know you have uh limited time today and you gotta rush so i just want to um also say congratulations on being the official kitchen at the ford oh yeah so that's going to be the first venue that offers plant-based mm -hmm. isn't that forward. crazy that's <clears throat> crazy that's insane and it's funny because i saw you at the ford <laughs> <laughs> When we were both there for Yo Yo Ma. You're right. Yeah, yeah. We just said hi to each other. Like, yeah. Yeah, but um, that was interesting. Yeah. And so, yeah, now you're like the person that's going to be running the food there. Congrats. Yeah. It's and crazy. if you could just get real quick into that, and then we'll just give you your final question. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's something that was in the works also prior to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, we were supposed to open there in 2020 and then that didn't happen as well. Oh, okay. So there were a lot of like letdowns in 2020, yeah. obviously for a lot of people. I just kept telling myself like this is happening to everybody. It's like not, yeah. it's not anything that I'm doing wrong. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and just kind of keep pushing through. And thankfully in 2021, we were able to open. And so I, I want to say that like, I don't, I haven't done the research if anybody out there has done the research, but I feel like we're the first plant-based venue yeah. um in the country i, think I know so. for sure <laughs> I, i'm pretty sure in the state now are you gonna be oh wait i was just saying the ford but that was at the, the hollywood <laughs> bowl when i saw you for yo yo ma oh that's right <laughs> that's right, was at the that's right. yeah so are you gonna be like the only kitchen and we're the only kitchen so there's not gonna be no mm -mm. nothing else so wow. we do <clears throat> i also do curate a marketplace uh okay. that's a part of the ford and I'm working with other vendors because they did they, although most the majority of people at the LA Phil because it's a LA Phil venue, yeah. were very excited about having plant based. They were still like, oh, but what about hot dogs? You know, and I was like, yeah. oh yes, those not, you know. Yeah. So I, I was like, and all right, what like if hot dogs? Yeah, I know, I know they do. Um, but I was able to also bring in like really exciting vendors, people that I've worked with at our previous kitchen where we were at, or at Smorgasburg Hollywood Farmers Market. Mm. So this marketplace is kind of this merger, this crossroads of like people who inspired me at Smorgasburg, people mm. who inspired me at Hollywood Farmers Market, at Crafted Kitchen and asking them to provide food. So, yeah. uh, and also like we have George's, um, you know, George's uh, burger stand yeah. from Cesar Chavez. Yeah, yeah. Like they, they bring us burritos oh, for the really? show. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of like, what can we hold there that makes sense for these shows? And so I, I curated that really thinking about like these small businesses that I, mm. that I care about that I think also represent LA in a really interesting way. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, I know that you have to get out of here, so we're going to have to cut this one short. Yeah. <laughs> and you have uh, things to do. But um, we ask every guest uh, a final question. And you have to try to answer in one sentence in as few e words as possible. <laughs> I ramble. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> so all of this work that you do, all of this drive, all of this, um, you know, like the need to like continue to continue to grow, continue to work, continue to grow. like, And... You keep everything afloat. And the question is, how do you do it? Honestly, it's with a team. So, you know, you're interviewing me, but I have all this, all these other people who also really care about the work and they hold it down. Definitely. You know, like they're there today prepping food for catering and events that we have going on. With a team. Yeah. Get smart people around you. Gotta yeah. Get <laughs> um well thank you very much and if people want to look up more about you find out more about your foods where should they look they can go to todo verde on instagram or go to todoverde.org our website and your website is jocelyn uh, chef jocelyn ramirez.com there it is there <laughs> see you next week <laughs>